So now, Sarah Brody and Barbara Sattler on Socrates the Bully, Rudeness and Cooperation, Socrates and the Protagoras. Thanks a lot, uh, Don, for organizing this wonderful colloquium since times have been so strange <laughs> um, for bringing us all together on a um, fortnightly basis. Um, let me start with a brief Captatio Benevolentia. Um, what we are presenting today is in fact a side project to what each of us are mainly doing. So apologies in advance to um, all the um, specialists on the Protagoras in the audience. What we are doing started originally from a puzzle that came up um, over and over again in a Greek reading group that we did on the Protagoras, um, namely the question, why does Socrates uh, seem to display such an irritable and irritating behavior in the Protagoras in comparison to his graciousness towards others of different opinion or different behavior in other dialogues? Um, and we were wondering whether there are any philosophical reasons for that. So what we'll do is I'll start out laying the field and basically trying to show that Socrates is in fact portrayed as behaving almost like a bully or quite bullyish um, um, to uh, Protagoras in the dialogue. Um, and looking um, at a few potential reasons for this behavior um, as a kind of a background and then Sarah will pick up there and uh, lay out what we take to be the actual reason for this strange um, behavior of Socrates. Okay, Socrates is usually um, depicted or at least that's um, how a lot of us kind of have, in our, have him in our mind as the controlled leader of the discussion in the dialogues. He's the person who can deal with difficult interlocutors, people who are full of themselves without, as it turns out, any good reason, such as me, no, you throw, and so on. Socrates can also deal with interlocutors who threaten him and question his whole methodology or want to walk out of the conversation, as Trasimachus does in the Republic. While Socrates challenges many of his interlocutors, or perhaps almost all of them, he usually does so in a polite and restrained way. He may be quite ironic in various ways, but usually he's not rude. But in the Protagoras, Socrates himself behaves as such a rude person who threatens to walk out of the conversation and only remains if the conversation continues in the way he wants. Socrates is rude towards Protagoras from the very beginning. Our first view of his relation to Protagoras is his claim when asked whether he comes from beautiful Archibiades, that Protagoras is even more beautiful than Archibiades, since the wise is more beautiful. But he continues with a rather strange claim that Protagoras is, quote, the wisest among those living now, if you assume Protagoras to be the wisest, unquote. So thus he seems to relativize the claim of Protagoras' wisdom to an assumption one may choose not to make. Then when finally meeting Protagoras at Callias's house at what seems to be a rather grand and formal occasion, Socrates does not greet Protagoras or welcome him to Athens and so on, but launches abruptly straight into his speech on behalf of Hippocrates. The effect is to suggest that Hippocrates, owner of a precious soul as likely to be corrupted as to be educated, is at least as deserving of consideration as Protagoras. In 318a, when the question has been raised what Hippocrates would gain from studying with Protagoras, Socrates immediately reacts to Protagoras' first answer, uh, namely, he will become better every day, in a rather unfriendly way that stripes the ambivalent term better of its moral meaning, a reaction to which Protagoras in 318d responds rather graciously. When Socrates doubts Protagoras' second answer, that Protagoras teaches Eubulea for this state and one's own business, by claiming that uh, Eubulea and Arete are not teachable, Protagoras gives first a mythos and then uh, an explanation, a logos, in how far Arete is teachable. And here he seems almost like an inverse Socrates, who normally gives us a logos first and then a mythos, as in the Republic or the Phaedo. 
even before the crisis of the dialogue, the first real conversation between Protagoras and Socrates about similarities and dissimilarities of the Arites, Socrates is rather bullying, leaving his conversation partner hardly any possibility apart from saying yes or no. When Protagoras introduces the relativity of what is useful in 343a following, Socrates tries to force him to short question and answers, threatening to leave the party otherwise. And this is now um, the, the crisis moment, so to say that's on the handout, the first passage on the handout, I quote, you know, Protagoras, I'm not exactly pleased myself that our session has not gone the way you think it should. But if you're ever willing to hold a discussion in such a way that I can follow, I will participate in it with you. People say of you, and you say yourself, that you are able to discuss things speaking either at length or briefly. You are a wise man after all. But I don't have the ability to make these long speeches. I only wish I did. It was up to you who had the ability to do both, to make this concession, so that the discussion could have had a chance. But since you're not willing, and I'm somewhat busy and unable to stay for your extended speeches, there's somewhere I have to go, I'll be leaving now, although I'm sure it would be rather nice to hear them." Unquote. Oh, sorry, no, this goes on. Having had my say, I stood up as if to go, but as I was getting up, Callias took hold of my wrist with his right hand and grasped his cloak I'm wearing with his left and sat, and then Callias continues. Okay. So here it seems we have Socrates behaving like a bully and a dishonest one at that. He threatens to leave if the conversation is not carried out in short questions and answers, and claims he cannot do it in any other way. But then he himself does not stick to this and gives drawn out answers. For example, in 342a, where he goes off on a tangent about the Lacedaemonians. And Socrates' reply to Protagoras' criticism of Simonides' poem is a very long-winded answer. Socrates claims not to have a good enough memory for long speeches, when he clearly remembers even small points from Protagoras' speech. Furthermore, even when he gets his way and Protagoras agrees to the question answer procedure, when Protagoras then makes a Socrates-like remark in 351e, Socrates snaps at him in a stroppy way, just claiming, do you want to lead a discussion or I? So that's the second um, passage on your handout. I quote, Socrates, well, I mean this, whether insofar as it is pleasurable, it's not good, thus asking whether pleasure itself is not a good. Um, Protagoras, as you always say, Socrates, let us inquire into this matter. And if this point seems to belong to the discussion and pleasure and the good are the same, we'll come to an agreement. But if not, we will disagree. Socrates, do you wish to lead this inquiry or shall I? Um, and Socrates' behavior here really leads to the kind of crisis in the roughly the middle of the dialogue. Um, and it needs the intervention of Callias, Alcibiades, Critias, Prodicus, and Hippias as mediators to have the conversation go on. Socrates makes it clear that he will only continue on his terms. And he's against any person being named umpire or judge. So he's also not allowing for, so to say, an impartial judge being set up. I'll propose. And things only continue in the end because Protagoras finally gives in, while rem remember, for instance, in the Mino, it's Socrates who gives in to the terms of discussion of Mino. So if we only had the Protagoras and no other dialogue of Plato's, and we did not know how important it is for Plato to distinguish between Socrates and the Sophists, after reading the first half of the Protagoras, we might end up with the impression that it's not really clear who the sophist is here, Protagoras or Socrates. For Socrates ends up arguing the opposite of what he originally claimed, namely that arete is not teachable. He conflates contrary and contradictory opposites when arguing that justice as not being pious has to be impious. Is far too rush in identifying courage and being confident at 350c. And without giving any reason, he does not allow that courage could in principle still be quite different from the other virtues, even if it's a form of knowledge or in part constituted by knowledge. So what then is the reason for this behavior of Socrates, which is usually more the behavior of one of his interlocutors, not his own? 
Is Socrates, after all, not always this gracious and level-headed person resting in himself, but sometimes himself a bully? We heard Dorothea Frede recently on the many facets of Socrates, but usually he seems to be much more on the gracious side than in the Protagoras. Is it that our image of the elderly Socrates in his wise treatment of immature and unreasonable interlocutors clouds the fact that the younger Socrates may not always have behaved like this? In the Protagoras, we're dealing with a youngish middle-aged Socrates who may be much more aggressive than the older Socrates and is not the kind of flexible promising youngster that we find Socrates in Plato's um, Parmenides. Or is the behavior of Socrates due to the person he's talking to, the sophist Protagoras? Now this question has two parts to it. Is it because he's talking to a sophist or uh, is it because he's talking to Protagoras in particular? And let me start with the sophist bit. While Socrates is usually portrayed as revealing the shortcomings of the sophists, their mere pretense at knowledge, their lack of moral integrity, their inability to give a consistent account of their art, Socrates is not usually impolite or even bullying. He's even friendly to the villain Trasimachus. He leaves the harsh judgment about the sophists to Anitos in the Mino. He starts out politely with Gorgias in the Gorgias. Um, remember in the Gorgias 458, Socrates warns him that he thinks Gorgias is contradicting himself and that he will stop the conversation if Gorgias is the kind of person who does not want and does not deal well with being contradicted and will only continue if he is like Socrates who welcomes being contradicted if they have said something untrue. So he's warning Gorgias here and not threatening to stop the conversation. So Socrates' behavior does not seem to be simply triggered by him talking to a sophist. What about the person Protagoras? Again, this question has two different parts. One is uh, the Protagoras is, he's depicted in Plato's poem uh, dialogue and the other one is uh, the historic Protagoras is what we know about the historic one. Let me start with Protagoras in um, Plato's dialogue. Protagoras is portrayed as if he were holding court in the house of Callias. He's walking through the house with an entourage behind him that listens to every word he says and makes sure they're never in his way. So it's kind of an impressive um, persona. Um, Hippias is sitting in the midst of his disciples and Prodicus is still in bed, but when the discussion with Socrates um, happens, then all three of them kind of uh, come together. So while Protagoras is depicted as this impressive um, kind of holding court person, he's also quite similar to Socrates in certain respects, as we already saw, and he is depicted as a rather friendly and gracious person. Um, he's willing uh, to engage with Socrates, concern about Hippocrates right away, um, what um, Socrates will get from his teaching. And um, he is, uh, when Socrates is not satisfied with uh, his first answer, um, he is, uh, doesn't mind Socrates kind of insisting on getting um, further answer. So he's dealing with all that in a very friendly and gracious way. Uh, and he's certainly a much more likable person than Trasimachus. So um, it seems there's no real reason on the surface level um, for Socrates' behavior. And that Socrates' behavior may not be simply tied to the person of Protagoras in the dialogue is um, perhaps also suggested by the fact that we get a bit of a foretaste of Socrates' behavior or aftertaste, depending on your chronology, um, uh, in, the, in the Gorgias uh, when Socrates talks to Polos, but he's by far not as rude and there's, there's a kind of um, little to and fro going on that explains um, Socrates' behavior there. But in his conversation with Polos in 461 to 462, Socrates asks Polos to his restrain his tendency to talk in long speeches. And then um, Polos claims uh, that this is a restriction of his freedom of speech. And Socrates replies by granting him this freedom, but also himself the freedom to leave and not to listen to him. So it, it, it makes it clear that if Polos cares about the conversation so far, he should join the short question answer mode that Gorgias and Socrates practiced before. So it's a, it's a, a little bit going in that direction, but by far not um, as bullying as in the Protagoras. 
this was Protagoras in Plato's dialogue. What about the historic Protagoras? Um, now, we have um, a few um, fragments left of the historic Protagoras, and um, there's only one point in this fragments where Socrates and Protagoras may be on the same wavelength, namely the interest in literary criticism. But in the dialogue, Socrates is shown as outclassing Protagoras in, the, in his interpretation of Simonides' poem. But all the other fragments that we have, all the other kind of main topics for which Protagoras um, is well known, must of course go against the grain of Socrates. So the man um, as the measure of all things um, doctrine and everything is relative to the perceiver or observer, um, doctrines that are investigated in detail in the theatres. The idea that we can make the weaker the stronger arguments, so we're arguing from both sides, and also the agnosticism uh, concerning the gods. So these are all uh, important points that um, would not fit, so to say, Socrates' value system. Um, now, I don't think it does explain in itself immediately why Socrates is so rude, but the relativism that we get out of the um, Socrat uh, pro uh, Protagorean fragments, and that's very strong there, that's something that we should hear in the background um, to what uh, we now take to be the, the actual reason for the rudeness of Socrates, which um, Sarah will now um, sketch. Okay, I just wanted to thank people who've come to this meeting and Don for arranging it and uh, introducing us and so on. So I'll just go straight to my part or my section of this um, joint paper. Okay, um, so why is Socrates rude and aggressive? As a number of scholars have suggested, Plato's focus is less on the success or not of the arguments that Socrates offers, for example, for the unity of the virtues, for the impossibility of acrasia, less on that than it is on the different and contrasting methodolo methodologies exemplified by him and Protagoras. These scholars usually locate the methodological opposition in the contrast of macrologia versus brachylogia, which of course is such a striking theme of the dialogue. We, however, want to make a somewhat different proposal. We certainly think that the macro brachylogia theme is relevant for spelling out the meaning of Socrates' rudeness, but we also think that a deeper methodological conflict is taking place beneath or behind the fight about long, long or short speeches. The deeper conflict is between embracing the fluidity and indeterminacy of words and concepts and pinning down word, between that and pinning down words and concepts so that they function as determinate units of fixed meaning. Um, units that retain their fixed meaning throughout any single stretch of speech in which they occur. We choose the locution stretch of speech to cover both monologues and exchanges between two speak speakers. So one thing to note is that a genuine exchange between two, it could be more than two, but we'll stick to two, between two speakers requires agreement, implicit or explicit, on the meanings of key words used by the parties. This holds even when the exchange is a preliminary one, whereby the two sides establish or agree on what they will both mean by some term T. For this, they have to agree implicitly at some stage, or there's going to be an infinite regress, that they do or will mean the same by phrases such as, quotes, mean the same, and words like understand. Thus, genuine exchanges, I, I'm fully aware that that phrase is extremely vague, genuine exchanges incline us towards treating keywords or meanings as fixed and determinate units. Otherwise, the parties talk past each other. Also, what we're calling genuine exchanges will tend to police themselves in this respect. That is, there will be moments when it becomes unclear to one or both sides 
whether they're using a, a term in the same sense and then one stops the other or they both just stop to check or they both just stop in order to check whether this is so and to make adjustments if not. It's natural to think that the individual speeches within a genuine exchange would be short. This is because a longer speech provides more cover for meanings to slide about. With a long speech, the logically conscientious listener has, has a dilemma. Let the speaker go on, which risks losing track of exactly how key words are behaving at each moment, or alternatively interrupt, which is unsettling for the speaker and might certainly be considered rude. Um, on, on the interpretation that we are suggesting, what Socrates at one point calls his own forgetfulness um, when he's asking Protagoras to, to, to use short speeches, because he, Socrates, is a forgetful sort of person, he says. What he calls his own forgetfulness does not actually single him out from everybody else, because all listeners to a long speech are liable to lose track in the way that I've just roughly indicated. Um, what's special about Socrates actually is that he is aware of this, most of us are not, and he's aware too that it's a danger. Um, I've just been reading or actually listening to one of, um, well, to M.M. McCabe's um, Say the Lectures, and she makes a, a, the very good point that although Socrates complains that he's forgetful, so please give me short speeches, um, this is falsified by the fact that he's narrating the whole dialogue um, uh, at the house of Callias uh, to a friend. I can't now remember whether it's the same, the same evening or the following day. So in an ordinary sense, he does not have a bad memory and presumably Plato actually wants us to, to note that uh, by comparing the frame dialogue in which Socrates sets up himself as a narrator with the very long narrated dialogue. Okay, now returning to our own theme, one can also ask, of course, how short is a short speech? And there isn't an easy answer. In one context, a minimal statement might be a logically basic assertion, affirming or denying one thing of one thing in Aristotelian language. In another context, a minimal statement might be a basic assertion plus some explanation of what is asserted or some support showing why this is a reasonable thing to say. Similarly, with the corresponding questions, sometimes a question is ungarnished, sometimes it comes with an explanation of why one is asking it. It's worth noting that even if shortness, however one measures this, may be a necessary condition for something to count as a stage in what we're calling a genuine exchange, it is certainly not a sufficient condition. Laconic precepts such as know thyself and nothing in excess are as short as can be, but they definitely do not expect an answer. They're not meant to be part of an exchange. Although they're cryptic um, and therefore short, uh, well, maybe not therefore, but anyway, they're cryptic and short, uh, they are final. It's the recipient's task to disentangle what they might mean. It is not the oracle's task to disambiguate herself. It's also worth noting that something can, in a sense, be a reply to something else without the two items constituting a genuine exchange. So for example, you could have an epideictic event with successive antif antiphonal speeches. For example, one extolling and the next one decrying Alexander the Great, but the points made in the second speech might be quite unrelated to those made in the first. I mean, I'm not saying that this would be a particularly good spectacle for spectators, but at least we can see that such a, such a thing is possible and that in a certain obvious sense, the second speech is a sort of reply or at least a response uh, to the first speech. Um, in such a situation. 
Um, I think I want to say that there is no such thing as a genuine exchange unless the, say, the decrier, the second person, on the whole, tries to meet what the extoler has said point by point, as well as maybe making some new points of their own. Note that the breakdown into points, even within a single long speech, is a sort of move towards brachylogia. Okay, so let's get back to Socrates and Protagoras. After Socrates has in, uh, delivered a number of reasons for being deeply skeptical on the possibility of teaching virtue, Protagoras, in his so-called great speech, replies point by point. Um, now, does this constitute a genuine exchange on his part with Socrates? Let's allow that it does, but in fact, only in a pretty coarse-grained way. We say this because of the glaring omission on both sides to lay down a single sense for what they mean by teaching and for what they mean by expertise or techne. But we certainly don't want to find fault with Plato on this account, since one, if not the aiming, a bit, sorry, if, if not the aim of staging this whole episode is to lay bare the ambiguity and general slipperiness of the notions of teaching and of techne. So let's look at the content of some of what Protagoras says. He says, the reason human beings need idos and decay, uh, um, uh, respect and justness, justice, is that without these qualities, cooperation is impossible. Now, might it be that Protagoras values idos and decay mainly or even only because they are a necessary condition for cooperation? Might his attitude be that any non-coercive or peaceful route to cooperation counts as an exercise of idos and decay just because it is non-coercive? Since the art of speaking is the great instrument for bringing people together peacefully, does Protagoras perhaps think that any effective use of speech for the sake of conciliation is a satisfactory manifestation of idos and decay? Does he think that being enablers of human cooperation is the full story about, about what idos and decay are for? indeed the full story of what they are. A strong sense of the absolute necessity for conciliation, where the alternative is the war of all against war, oh, sorry, the war of all against all, which is the, the, the picture that we're given in, um, in this mythical part of, of Protagoras's big speech. A strong sense of the absolute necessity for conciliation brings a willingness on the part of all concerned, not to insist on any very definite formulations of the terms of agreement, but instead to go, to go for negotiated vagueness, so consider diplomatic announcements after a summit or whatever. This means that many key words have to be, and indeed to continue to be, uh, slippery slidey borne along by readiness to compromise on what they mean and on whether they mean, whether they mean the same to the various parties. This situation gives rhetoric, the art of persuasion, its perfect opportunity and raison d'etre. The rhetor knows how to exploit the slippery slidiness of words. And in the scenario that we've sketched, the fundamental vocation of rhetoric is to enable people to get along together. Rhetoric exists to serve above all the cause of community and justice. So rhetoric is a noble calling deserving superlative prestige and having on its, size, uh, having on its side Zeus himself who gave to man idos and decay. Even granting that rhetoric can be used in ways that give the speaker an unfair advantage over others, we cannot conceive of seriously repudiating rhetoric 
because rhetoric, after all, is what makes civilization possible. And rhetoric depends on, and therefore civilization depends on, the malleability of words. Okay, now I've just outlined a certain stance in praise of rhetoric, if you like. Now this stance might make sense if one were only ever faced with the crudest of primitive choices between adherence to conciliation building rhetoric, um, the choice between that and the war of all against all. But that is not our sit actual situation. Communities and cities do now exist. And although they are not indestructible from within, they are relatively stable and they could mostly benefit from radical criticism, criticism that not only takes issue with specific features or specific values of the social environment, but also with the whole atmosphere of an unself-critical cooperation, and also with, of course, with any atmosphere of unself-critical verbal conflict. Enter Socrates. He stands for using words as tools for finding things out, specifically finding things out about values and about how we stand with respect to what we claim are our values. And this is because he envisages that we could do better. This attitude makes no sense unless one assumes that there are objective ethical realities with more or less definite natures, natures that can be pinned down and examined. But words are our only available tools for this. So we must learn to tailor our use of words so that the words become fit to represent the determinate ethical realities. Even if we don't know in any detail what, what each of these realities is, so for example, we can't yet give a satisfactory definition of justice or of courage, even if all of that, we'll never begin to even to track our objects of interest unless we start treating our words as determinate units of definite meaning. Hang on to the exact words, assign one meaning to each, and insist on keeping the assignments constant throughout. In effect, this method operates with words as if they were terms of mathematics, a discipline which Protagoras at 318d uh, despises as unfit to be part of a young man's higher training. Okay, so this we suggest is the method which, which Socrates stands for in the dialogue Protagoras. Socrates is against long speeches because they give cover to the slippery, slidey use of word, words. But the main point, uh, the main point that we're trying to make is not that those who make long speeches have opportunities to take advantage of phenomena such as ambiguity. The main point rather is that the archetypal Protagorean Rhetor sees words as essentially malleable. Definite meaning is not just something that words often lack, but which everyone with different degrees of sincerity agrees that they ought to have. Instead, there really is no such thing as in definite meaning. We've got a sort of Heracliteanism about uh, semantics, if you like. Hence, there is no such thing as ambiguity because ambiguity presupposes a plurality of definite meanings associated with the same expression. Arguably, this is taking it a bit further, there are no such things even as fallacies at all, because there is no such thing as logic. There is just whatever the speaker makes of the words, which in themselves are not vulner vulnerable to abuse, because they are devoid of any rule of use for use. So um, a possible example of this in our dialogue is a passage T3 on the handout. Here, I won't, uh, I won't read it out, it's not a very long passage. Uh, Protagoras is usually read here as saying, I'll say P if that's what you want, even if I don't accept P myself. 
it's a point in the argument in which he's beginning to get pretty annoyed. Um, but we want to try to read this a bit differently. For, that is with Protagoras saying, I'll go along with what you say, since it doesn't really matter whether we say this or something else. Um, what we say is malleable to the extent that it hardly matters exactly what we do say. Okay, I've just got to readjust my screen a moment for a moment. Now, Socrates' main aim, we suggest, is to get Protagoras to recognize the Socratic method with words, his method of words, and to take it seriously. This is more important than any aim of convincing Protagoras by means of arguments using the method. So the arguments may not work, and that may, may not be very important. But what is important is that Protagoras should be got to at least take the method seriously. We can be pretty sure that even if Protagoras can't see how to find fault with Socrates' proof that the virtues are one, he, that is Protagoras, will still continue to view them as many, or at least to see courage as different from the others. But that doesn't matter. That is the fact that he's not convinced by Socrates' use of the Socratic method doesn't matter as so much anyway, as long as Protagoras recognizes that he has been brought, overtly at least, to concede the unity of the virtues. And he's been brought to this by a real method quite different from his own or from his own various methods. But he's only led to this discussion because he's made a, to this concession, because he's made a prior concession. And that is the concession of joining with Socrates as a partner in exercise of the Socratic method. Not only has he, Protagoras, conceded that his own game is not the only game in town, but by staying in the conversation with Socrates on Socrates' terms, he also acknowledges that the Socratic game can't just be dismissed as empty or childish. Now, how does Protagoras get to this point? It's Socrates who gets him to it, but not by argument. Um, and this is, uh, uh, this is because he could, not get it, uh, he could not get him to it by argument. Socrates can't, by his own new method of argument, argue Protagoras into taking that same method seriously, since that would assume that Protagoras takes it seriously already. Nor would it help Socrates to persuade so uh, Protagoras to take it seriously by engaging in word with words in a sort of Protagorean, slippery, slidey way. No doubt Socrates or Plato through him has the ability to do this effectively, but he would thereby betray the method for which he stands and surely the very astute Protagoras character would see this and capitalize on it. When the going gets tough, Socrates falls back on the time-honored devices of persuasion. He does not trust his own method. Our suggestion is that it's Socrates' rudeness that gets Protagoras to take his method seriously. Socrates resort, resorts to the great alternative to persuasion, namely force, even though it is psychological force, not physical force. He refuses to concede an inch from the beginning. He refuses to concede an inch to Protagoras, Protagoras's assumption that he, Protagoras, is the big authority in the room. By dissociating himself from the other's deference to Protagoras, Socrates shows a brutal willingness to allow this supposedly brilliant and even historic gathering uh, to fall apart into an ugly breakup. And since the gathering is for the sake of the great Protagoras, its breakup would be a major humiliation for him, even if Socrates would be to blame. And Socrates would be to blame, but it doesn't follow that uh, uh, Protagoras is not seriously damaged by it. And Protagoras would be further disgraced in relation to his host, Callias, 
who has, after all, has acted as impresario for a brilliant performance by Protagoras. All this is true, even if it's also true that the churlishness of Socrates would have been a crucial factor in the fiasco, the fiasco of the party breaking up. Socrates uncompromisingly cancels the laws of politeness with the effect, which is of course facilitated by Alcibiades intervention, that Protagoras blinks first. By wrecking the deferential atmosphere, Socrates breaks Protagoras in so that he's now willing to give the time of day to the new method. Protagoras does not have to agree with the conclusion Socrates reaches by this method, but he does have to respect the method itself. And if he disagrees with the conclusions, he, like us, must pinpoint places where Socrates' reason, reasoning went wrong. Socrates emerges, it seems to me, from this episode, not as someone who is truly less polite than Protagoras, but rather as someone who refuses to put politeness ahead of the Socratic method, something which Protagoras couldn't have refused to do because he didn't know about the Socratic method up until this moment. We've stressed how in rhetoric on what we think of as the Protagorean model, words or meanings don't have a proper identity of their own. They're there for the speaker to do what he likes with. On what we take to be the Socratic model, the, the meanings are not subordinate to the speaker. It's the other way round. The speaker must follow where the autonomous le me meanings lead, and so must the hearer. Now we have logic and actually the possibility of science. More to the point, or more to the immediate point, we now have speaker and hearer, or interlocutors, not merely basking in, agree in an agreeable haze of basically contentless to togetherness, or each struggling to wrest control of the words from the other and take them over for himself. Instead, we have them following in common knowledge that both or all are following it, a definite path which no one can just make lead in whatever direction they please. In short, the words and meanings govern the speakers, not the other way around. The sense that no one of them, one of them is in charge of the words and meanings, which are now displaying a life of their own, gives rise to a shared interest in discovering where it is that they're all going to or being taken to and a shared interest, therefore, in keeping the path free of obstructions. In short, the focus on a shared and autonomous definite goal of words and meanings implies a sense of a shared enterprise. If the discourse assumes the question and answer format, this is no longer antagonistic. The critical questions are meant to forward the joint search for truth, if instead, the discourse takes the form of a longer speech. This is no longer a bid to outdo other speeches that precede or follow it. Speaker and listeners or questioner and answerer knowingly cooperate in service to the authority of the independent logos. This perhaps explains why the dialogue Protagoras ends on what seems to be a note of genuine comradeship between the two protagonists. So finally, uh, this is uh, just a very brief postscript, um, a word on Prodicus as depicted in the Protagoras and elsewhere. Prodicus is intensely concerned about the exact meanings of words and clearly he sees the words as having very definite meanings independently of us. So is he in Socrates' methodological camp? The answer, we think, is no. And this is because uh, the autonomy of meanings, as we've tried to depict it, only manif manifests itself when definite words and meanings constitute a path that leads somewhere definite and objective. The autonomy, in other words, exerts itself dynamically 
and is felt through the sense of being led step by step to somewhere new and possibly unexpected. The Prodicon technique of comparing pairs of static near synonyms might be an adjunct to what we've been calling the Socratic method, but it's not part of it. That's it, thank you very much. Thank you. I'll, um, I'll clap on behalf of the muted many and, uh, and say that uh, we'll now move to discussion. The way we'll do the discussion is basically the same procedure as we have used for those of you who've uh, uh, been here before. Um, if you have a question or comment to make, use the um, raise your hand function um, which is now under reactions. Um, uh, I'd like to make a comment. Uh, because we're so many, um, it's important to um, ask your questions or make your comments concisely. And please, just one question or comment uh, per person. Uh, some, some of these events, you find someone. And my fourth question is, and we don't have time for that, um, uh, uh, and uh, you can direct your comment or question to either of our speakers, that's an added complexity, or to both. Um, and uh, that's basically what I had wanted to say about ground rules. Um, I'll start out with William Strigel. Oh, hi, everybody. Uh, thanks. Yeah, uh, I really appreciate this, uh, this talk. Um, it's good to see some people that I know um, I'm being locked away for so long here in Ireland. I have a complimentary and a complimentary comment. So I love the paper. I have no disagreements uh, whatsoever with, 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 the, um, with your arguments in terms of methodology here. I just wanted to uh, make a comment about the so-called historical Protagoras that you tried to etch out in the very beginning. Um, I think it's important to also take account of uh, uh, the fact that Protagoras and Socrates too probably were treated in a comedy by Eupolis um, in 421 on which the dialogue itself is in significant part based um, where, you know, the, the two meet in Callias's house and um, presumably there's like a clash between them from what we can gather from the fragments, perhaps uh, 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 Professor Constant has something else to say about this. I've written about it elsewhere. But the point anyway is that Protagoras is an overly deferential sort of person because he's a flatterer, right? Um, and he doesn't want to disagree with Socrates. Whereas, you know, in that respect, he, he represents everything that could be an antitype to Socrates as a person and in terms of his methodology. So I thought that might be important to keep in mind. I don't know if it's helpful to you. Well, thanks a lot for for that as as a as a background. Um, uh, it's, it's a bit unfortunate that we don't have the whole piece, right? So as that that would be very cool to read them um, back to back um, with the protagonist. But it's um, uh, I mean it's 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 useful to keep this in mind, and also that I, I take it there would be quite a bit more to say about the last bit you brought in, um, Protagoras is a, uh, somebody who wants to flatter other people and therefore may behave in a, in a friendly, gracious and so on way, um, such as to already set his uh, first steps for, for the flattering and persuading people. So there's a, there's a whole a lot more to be said. Um, I take it about the character Protagoras um, that would be interesting as a background, even though we don't think it is the decipher decisive thing, but that explains um, exact um, replies of Protagoras in, in the dialogue. So thanks a lot for that. All right. Um, the order of the raising of the hands uh, is different for me in one part of my screen rather than the other. So forgive me if it seems to you I call people slightly out of order. Uh, Eliza Ashraf. Um, thank you, Sarah and Barbara, for that uh, very interesting presentation. I really enjoyed it. Um, my question is, given that Socrates' aim seems to be to, you know, remove these ambiguities when making speeches, and that's why he encourages brachologia, and that might also explain his rudeness or at least lack of um, politeness, 
I just want to clarify why he engages after calling out Protagoras in text one in the handout, why he engages in these um, long speeches then and seemingly like irrelevant almost. And I'm thinking particularly of the speech about the Spartans and their education. And is it just to sort of show that he can meet Protagoras on the playground toe to toe or is, it, is there some other reason behind it? Um, I'll have a stab at this. Um, I have to say that I don't have a good answer to your question, which is a very relevant question. Um, or I don't as yet have um, a good answer to it. Um, uh, so, sorry, that's really the most that I can say at, at the moment. Um, I hope very much that not being able to answer all the pertinent uh, questions that arise doesn't too much undermine the plausibility of what we have tried to put in front of you. Uh, right, Barbara, do you want to add to that? Um, just um, perhaps, I mean, I, I, I take it that the, the long uh, winded answers um, concerning the, um, the poem, um, there, there's a reason for that because uh, things getting much more complex once we're dealing with the uh, Simonides poem where we're also dealing with different dialects and we are dealing with um, a distinction um, between uh, something like the meaning of a word, word. and a concept. Yeah. So, so there I think there's a good reason for the next step of complexity. The Lacedaemonians itself, that's um, also a bit puzzling to me and I, I also just still searching for an answer for this bit. Um, okay, Verity Hart. Uh, thanks. Uh, hello, Barbara, Sarah. Um, hello, Hi, everybody. Verity. Nice to, to see, see you. Thanks. Thanks so much for the for the paper. Um, I'm going to follow instructions and just ask one of the many questions I have, and maybe the biggest picture one. Um, I'm wondering if I should be disappointed if you're right. So. Um, Protagoras blinks. What if he hadn't, right? Is, is it a consequence of your view that the only way to get somebody on board with the Socratic method is for them to be sort of signed up already to some pretty significant both methodological and metaphysical views and otherwise all we have left is rudeness and bullying and we may get them to blink first but there might be a Callicles waiting in the wings who doesn't blink. Well um, I think that if Protagoras hadn't blinked then the party would have ended. I mean I think that's basically uh, what we're meant to think. That's the, the counterfactual, that's the closest possible world to the world in which he does blink. And maybe, I'm not sure about this, but Plato may have meant a general message to emerge from this, that if in any similar sort of confrontation or methodological confrontation, um, if somebody doesn't give, if the, the long, um, if the Protagorean person doesn't give way, then we're just not going to have an exchange. Um, Plato, like Socrates, would look at it like that because he would think, um, the Socrates or the Plato is not going to give way in front of this slippery slidiness. Um, uh, and uh, so if anybody gives way, it's going to be have, have to be the other guy. Does that answer your question, Verity? Well, I think it makes it a yes for it being kind of disappointing because it means that we can't really have a conversation with anybody who has, you know, these kind of different views that that seems to me a, a somewhat disappointing outcome if it's true but oh, we also i mean we have sorry go on sarah no please go ahead Barbara, no please. i just I, I just want to say um i'm not quite i mean it, it may be disappointing uh for your verity but i'm i'm i think it actually fits um other other parts of plato's oeuvre i mean we know that rationality can be very fragile right we know it from the apology and so on. So um, if we can't um, 
start arguing with people because of these problems and there's persuasion and that leads us into a very different route or there's this what Socrates tries in the in the Protagoras so um, it, I don't think that Plato necessarily suggests that we it is possible to have a conversation with everybody all the time there there are restrictions to that yes I agree All right, um, next question, Ed Halper. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for the paper, both of you. It's very nice. Um, I particularly like the part about the discussion of the content of the great speech and how Protagoras seems to think that uh, just being able to give a speech is important for the constitution of the state as a, as a, or the constitution of a community. And I wanted to press you a little bit on this, maybe a little bit to go a little further. Um, if being able to give a speech is part of what's essential to constitute a community, then isn't Socrates's resistance, his obstreperousness, his bullying, isn't that a kind of dramatic refutation of, um, of Protagoras's ability to give a speech and constitute a community by means of the speech? And um, even at the beginning of it, uh, Protagoras, the, the three sophists are in separate rooms. So even before Protagoras has opened his mouth, in some sense, he's been, he's been refuted. It's fine if you have one sophist and you can convince everybody, but if you have three or four in the room, then, uh, then you, you don't have the basis for a community. And uh, that seems to be undermining uh, Protagoras. And um, it's interesting in, in the later on that the uh, Socrates enlists Prodicus's help to get Protagoras to agree, to, agree uh, to his new other procedure to taking turns. But uh, it's really the, the audience, the people, they don't want the conversation to end and, and they, they insist uh, that, that both of them come to a compromise. And that's uh, a theme that's taken up again in the Republic that the uh, state exists not for the leaders of the state, but for the people who uh, require some sort of leadership, whose the state fulfills the needs of the of the people. So, I just wanted to throw those out as suggestions and see what your thoughts were. Well, those are very helpful um, pointers, Ed. Thank you very much, and it's very nice to see you. Um, I think, I mean, there's an awful lot going on in what you've just said. It's a very, very nice point, which I, I hadn't thought of, um, that uh, at the beginning, at any rate, there are, there, there are these three sort of sophistic en enclaves, and they're very pointedly not communicating with each other. Um, uh, so does that, how are we to weigh that against um, all the stuff in Protagoras' great speech about uh, conciliation and 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 all of that. Um, I think, frankly, I I can't at this moment concisely uh, respond to all the things that you've suggested in your remarks, and so I think I'll stop talking. And if Barbara wants to add that, that now she she should. I just actually have a question back. I wasn't quite sure whether your suggestion was that Protagoras is really, so the way that Plato sets up the three sophists is already undermining Protagoras or that Protagoras also himself is undermining um, his, his ideas about um, the relationship between speeches and statehood in the, in the great speech. Yeah, I think both. I mean, it's set up already so that you have three, three people who are yeah. not united when speech is supposed to bring everybody together. And also so, uh, Protagoras' speech is supposed to convince everybody. And it almost does, except Socrates has one little problem that's bothering him. Uh, so, so his failure to convince everybody sort of shows the, the limitations of relying on speech and conviction to constitute a state. That's, that's what, that was my suggestion. Okay, um, we have a comment from Sarah Monison in the chat. I'll just read it. 
Um, this was compelling, but I have a question about your decision to use the English word bully. Does that word really capture your points about being Socrates' uh, calculated rudeness and demanding attitude? Is that the same as um, bullying? Barbara, you want that reply? To this, this? Uh, so we have a question from Sarah Monison Prodicus. Right. Um... I mean, I take it you can't, you, you can be rather rude um, without it being bullying. You can be rude in ignoring people. You can be rude in, in just interrupting them all the time or something like this. And in some sense, I think bullying does capture what we see because Socrates wants Protagoras to join into this enterprise, this his way of trying to fix meaning of words and having a very controlled um, investigation of what, you know, uh, arete means and how the different parts relate and so on. Um, so it's, it's not just any old form of um, um, bullying, uh, sorry, um, it's not just any old form of being rude. Um, and um, it has something of wanting to, to get this other person to do things in the way you want it to do. Now, there is a good reason in this case. It's not just bullying for bullying's sake. Um, but nevertheless, it has, I think, the features of what we would capture with the English term bullying. I would only add that we, in, we um, um, did add a question mark, at least in the final version of our title, uh, to um, uh, the word bully. And so we were maybe did have a few doubts as to whether this was the absolutely perfect word, but as uh, Don has just in indicated, we need a prodicus to help us here. Um, if, uh, if I could jump in and ask a related question, we have the advantage that one of our two speakers is a native speaker of another language. Uh, Barbara, what would you call Socrates in German? Okay, that is difficult because I think the English word bully actually is, is great. Yeah. And um, we sometimes in German even use that word, um, uh, bully. I mean, um, what would I call him? Um, That's fine. Let me think about it because there's, there, there isn't an obvious German word that comes to my mind. Okay. So, um, uh, Merrick Anderson. Uh, hello. Uh, thank both of you. Thank you both for the paper. And hi, Sarah. Hope you're doing well. Hi, Merrick. Hi, Merrick. Um, yeah. So I wanted to ask about um, the sort of distinction between method you find in uh, Protagoras and Socrates. And I think I'm inclined to want to push back a bit. And so I'm going to try and do that and see how you respond. And let me just quickly start by saying um, that I don't think the, I'm not 100% convinced already that we need to have this sort of fluctuating meanings of terms when it comes to the great speech. It seems to me that um, the sort of view Protagoras puts forward there actually presupposes a pretty determinate set of features that human nature possesses that's different from other um, animals um, and is at least in principle amenable to very clear and articulate um, discussion. And, and um, so with that in the background, I just wanted to ask uh, about this historical claim or you know, this fact we find in Diogenes Laertius where we're told that Protagoras in fact invented the Socratic method. Um, and I take it that what Diogenes Laertius means when he's talking about that is this sort of question and answer um, back and forth, which elicits, um, in some cases, a contradiction. Um, so that, I mean, I do want to know what you think about that. And, and I want to sort of also suggest we get an example of that in the dialogue itself um, on Protagoras's part. When he asks Socrates to evaluate this poem from Simonides, he actually mm -hmm. runs for one Socrates through sort of a Lenkis. Um, where he apparently gets Socrates to agree, I think, that the poem has been well composed, but that it's also um, uh, admits of a contradiction within the contents of the poem. And he, uh, you know, reduces Socrates to 
uh, you know, a contradiction, if you'd like, where he says, how can something that contains a contradiction within itself be well composed? And that looks very much like a sort of Socratic Alenkis. Um, and while I am aware of no historical evidence that suggests that this would require in Protagoras's cases, a sort of fixed meaning of words, it does sort of look like you'd want words uh, to have fixed meaning if you're going to sort of derive some sort of contradiction from the person you're talking to. So I, I wonder whether in fact Protagoras may well have actually done the sort of thing you seem to uh, think Socrates trying to get him to sort of buy into in this dialogue. Right, thanks very much. That's a very good question. I mean, obviously there are a lot of very sort of definite ideas that uh, Protagoras puts forward in the great speech. Um, uh, and what you say about um, uh, the uh, interaction with Socrates about the Simonides poem um, also shows uh, Protagoras with a sort of sharp nose for uh, possible contradiction that, uh, and, and, and he clearly takes in uh, the verbal distinctions that Socrates then makes between being and becoming wise or virtuous and so forth. Um, so I'm not suggesting that, so that Protagoras just exists in a kind of cloud of Heraclitean verbal flux. I, that that it was, wasn't the, well, I didn't guard against this impression, but that's not what I wanted to say or what we wanted to say. Rather, the thought is that um, over so-called key concepts or uh, verbally speaking key words, um, it doesn't, especially if one's building a case, it does not matter what the word means. Um, I mean, obviously this is only so going, going to be so in, within limits, um, the shades of Alice in, in Wonderland, et cetera, et cetera. But um, I mean, it's absolutely sort of screaming at you from the great speech um, and also from Socrates' initial uh, criticism of the idea that virtue can be taught, that there is no attempt to analyze what we mean by teaching. Um, he moves, I mean, if one's going to be accurate about it, Protagoras, as it were, moves from one model of teaching to another without any explication or justification. And so when it's something as important, both to not only to philosophy, but to people's lives like Hippocrates, whether virtue can be taught and to be saying this with great conviction and with great skill, as Protagoras does, without ever reflecting on what is the meaning of teaching, let alone what is the meaning of virtue. I think this is what Socrates is trying to stand up against. And if that's correct, then that, can be, that is quite compatible with Protagoras making a lot in different ways of quite sharp verbal points about other things. I mean, he's quite sharp about Simonides' poem, but possibly the subtext of all that, that whole episode is Simonides' poem is actually not important to be, to be sharp about. What's important to be sharp about is things like the nature of virtue and the nature of teaching, why we came, why so Socrates and Hippoc Hippocrates came to this party and uh, etc. I hope that's not too much to one side of what you were saying, Merrick. Thanks very much for the, the question anyway. Pauline Sabrier. Right, thank you very much for uh, uh, this talk about a very interesting topic. Um, perhaps it's because I'm, I'm taking your, your, I'm reading your, your, and yeah, I took your claim too strongly, but it seems to, I mean, I have the impression that a consequence of your view, view is that, I mean, by, yeah, singling out Protagoras, um, as, uh, as you do here, you, you take him somehow to be um, the worst interlocutor, I mean, somehow he may appear to be as the worst interlocutor ever. And it is because of Protagoras actually that we we have this um, rudeness from from the part uh, on the part on Socrates' part. It's because uh, uh, Protagoras is so unwilling to 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 play the game uh, as Socrates wants him to. But but we have this reaction. But if if that's if that's um, so to say um, somehow in some sense Protagoras' fault, then 
it seems to imply that there is, um, on the contrary, something that all other interlocutors in all of the dialogues where Socrates is not that rude, uh, something in common, a much uh, a common ground, uh, perhaps, as you said, that they, they accept the Socratic method or something like this, which seemed to me, at first sight at least, uh, more than I was ready to accept that was uh, common uh, uh, um, among all these other uh, interlocutors. I think I understand your question and it's a, a, a quite a sort of, um, it's a very interesting question. Um, I think I want to say, and not everybody will agree with this, as it were, methodology of approaching Plato's dialogues, that perhaps each dialogue may be allowed to teach a different lesson. Um, uh, if so, then the fact that not everybody whom Socrates is pleasant and polite to in other dialogues, not everybody is, as it were, already a Socratic in their method. Um, it's not actually directly relevant to the lesson that's being taught, as we as have been suggesting in our paper, um, in this dialogue of Protagoras. I hope that's clear and I hope it, it, it responds to your question. But let me add perhaps two things. One is, I think with almost all the sophists, we find some methodological discussion going on. And I think part of the reason is that some of the um, under interlocutors, they just don't have any clue about methods and they're not thinking about it. I mean, Euthyphro, for instance, and Meno, they just wanna um, you know, either give an answer or ask for, you know whether virtue is teachable, but they don't really think about how to go about it and so on. And by contrast, I think with the sophists, um, there is some method um, that all of them are somehow practicing. Um, and it is a method that normally um, Socrates um, thinks is not the kind of right method. So there are always these kind of methodological discussions. Think about Thrasymachus' attack on the methodology of, of Socrates. And then Im immediately with Scorgias, there's a, there's a question about long and short um, answers. Um, but um, so, so, so part of the reason why not uh, he's in route to some of them is also because this, this question doesn't really come up. But then also I think with Protagoras, it really matters actually. So he is um, a person who is very important for educating um, the, the, the youth in, in, in Greece. Um, and so um, a conversation with him about Arete is something that is potentially very valuable and very important. And so therefore, you know, he puts his foot down to also try to show him that here's a method that we should actually really follow. Yeah? Um, and it's not a, a, a person whose influence will not be important. So therefore here, it really matters. That, that is also shown in the Brutus, I think. William Altman. Um, thanks. Um, I'd like to um, develop Sarah Monison's point a little bit on, on bullying. Uh, with a with a kind of um, alteration of a, a more pertinent version of Don Morrison's question, which which is what would be the Greek word for bullying? Uh, I take it that if Plato wants us to try to figure out whether Socrates is a bully, uh, he needs a Greek word for us to wonder about if it's to be a legitimate question. Um, the word hubristes uh, is used by Socrates himself uh, when he parodies what a hubristes would do. I think that's a plausible idea. It's also picked up by Alcibiades in the related dialogue, Alcibiades Major, uh, where Alcibiades accused Socrates of being hubristis. But, but it seems to me that, that, that philonicane, the verb, is more doing the duty that you guys need if Plato actually wants us to think whether Socrates is an X um, uh, it, with something like the meaning of bully. I think he does want a win. And I, think, and I think you give short shrift to Prodicus in the dialogue because I loved Sarah Brody's repeated use of the word slippery slidiness. I think that that's excellent. I'm, di I'm dying to ask her a question about the Timaeus, but I won't because of Don. But it seems to me that you can make a much better case that Socrates is practicing slippery slidiness and, then, and that it, indeed it is the role of Protagoras in the, in the 
dialogue to indicate that. And, and the word that I would point to above all is the word good. Um, by, and I think that Plato wants us to realize this, that by equating the good with the pleasant at one point in the dialogue, and then acquainting the good with the, uh, with the beautiful in another part of the dialogue, it, it, that, that, that the word good does not have that precise technical Aristotelian sense of a kind of determinate, sanitized, Socratic use of clean language, very evidently. It's a word that, as, as Protagoras actually explains, is capable of a great variety of, of meanings and uh, it seems to me that what you guys are calling bullying is best understood as Socrates' desire and, and accomplished desire to win. <laughs> and that everything he does, including the passages you don't want to explain, like the, the Spartan section or the Simonides explication, should all be understood not because Socrates is a bully, but because Socrates is determined to mop the floor in public with the wisest man in Greece, and does. Thanks very much. That's a great um, question or comment. Um, well, I feel rather torn in trying to respond because uh, if I want to retain uh, standard admiration or respect for Socrates, I don't just want to see him even in just one dialogue as desiring to win, even if it's over the greatest sophist in Greece. Um, so maybe I've got this sort of pious goody-goody picture of Socrates that's pushing me. Um, and according to that picture, um, the method uh, that Socrates is supposed to stand for, at least according to Barbara's and my presentation. The method is what it's really all about, what Socrates is really all about. And yes, he does want that method to prevail when discussing things like virtue over the method, if it can be called that, of Protagoras, who when he gets on to questions like whether virtue can be taught, just literally just waffles around between different, what we would think of as different senses of teaching and so forth. Um, if Socrates just desires to win, then I'm afraid uh, all our um, kind of criticism, negative criticism of the very poor arguments he gives to show the unity of the virtues and the pretty suspicious, as you've brought out, uh, William, um, argument that he gives about um, about Acrasia, I mean, all of that, I'm afraid, com comes to the fore. If he just does desire to win, then the fact is that what this dialogue is showing us, whether intentionally or not by Plato, is actually Socrates failing very badly. Can I pick up here and say also a bit more on the defense? Um, so A, I don't think that Plato needs to use the word if he wants to depict um, Socrates as bullying. So you can just show that in his action and in his replies. B, um, you know, wanting to win and being a bully don't necessarily have to go apart. So you can be a bully in wanting to win, but I think it's very clear that Socrates doesn't just want um, Protagoras here on the floor. He wants, if you want to win in the sense of, okay, now we are following this method in order to show where we can get there. So it's not just for the sake of, winning and I think the end where you know he makes it very clear that he himself has been refuted by the logos also shows that that here we are dealing with a method where you follow the meaning of terms and the logos and that will lead you somewhere that could refute yourself and that's okay as well um, and then about the goodness the slippery slope I mean I take it one thing that is important in the contrast between Prodicus and Socrates um, because you said we're giving too much short shrift to Prodicus. I mean, Prodicus is a very interesting figure to have in here. But um, one key difference is that also, I mean, Socrates switches um, the meanings of words, but he, he tries to keep them stable in one discussion and in one, uh, when, when talking about one topic. And Prodicus, the, the way we, it's, he's depicted here in the dialogue is 
mainly bringing in kind of wrong distinction or unnecessary or unuseful distinction. He makes a wrong confirmation um, that Simonides means uh, Kakon when talking about Chandepon, right, which turns out not actually to be um, how to interpret the, the poem. He makes unnecessarily pedantic distinction of words um, in 300, um, uh, 337a when, when the, you know, he tries to act as a mediator. Um, and then when uh, Socrates talks about um, whether, you know, um, you would call it fear or dread, um, if expecting something unpleasant. Um, he is also making this kind of distinction at a point where it doesn't really matter, right? Because it's, it is just about this attitude about kind of fearing something. So we see Prodicus in some sense kind of stabilizing some meanings of the words, but not in a helpful way, not in a way that helps investigation um, and um, not in a way that uh, helps us follow the logos along in figuring out something about the topics discussed. Um, Max Deboff. Hey, thank you for a um a very fascinating talk and I have a lingering worry. Um, if this interpretation is true, Socrates seems to become a much less interesting character. His irony, for example, in calling himself forgetful, a moment which might seem downright humorous to me at least, becomes perhaps a calculated serious claim. And his Seymour is deliberate misinterpretation of Simonides and its parodic value and the over-the-top bit with the Spartans and Cretans. And so, I mean, I've been making some assumptions here perhaps about, about how we might want to read the dialogue, but I'd love to hear about how you think your interpretation bears on the fun of the dialogue and its literary aspects. Okay, well, um, uh, first of all, um, I, about the irony, supposed irony of his say, saying that he's a forgetful person. Um, I mean, it's hard to know how to take that, uh, given that, uh, as, I, as I said, and McCabe has made, the, made this point very nicely, um, he's narrating this whole long and complicated um, event uh, to somebody else. So he's not a forgetful person, on the contrary. He's got a very good memory. So he could just be being ironic in the conversation with Protagoras and everybody else saying, I, I'm a forgetful person. I just can't remember the first thing you said when you're halfway through your speech. Um, it could just be that he's talking about, as it were, ordinary forgetfulness when I, you know, I've forgotten paragraph one when I'm in paragraph 17. Um, but I was suggesting, or we were suggesting, that um, he might also or alternatively mean a different kind of forgetfulness, uh, which is perhaps now being introduced for the first time, uh, namely uh, the fact that you cannot hang on to what somebody said if they just go on and on without any definite uh, fixed or agreed upon meanings. Um, it just rushes through the hearer's mind as a sort of mindless stream, really. Uh, this would be a kind of, for quotes, forgetfulness that afflicts anybody who's subjected to a that kind of speech, whether from a sophist or from a, you know, an ex-American president or whoever. Um, um, so it's a special kind of forgetfulness, which perhaps Socrates is the first to have quite noticed, as it were. I actually think that also it makes um, Socrates not um, a less interesting, actually a more interesting character, because it shows a side of him that we normally don't see, and it, so to say, makes him a more complex character that at certain points also has to retreat to um, a, a way of getting people to hear that we normally don't associate with him. So I don't, um, I think it, it still allows him some sense of irony, some sense of humor, but it adds another facet of him that we normally don't want to associate with him. Uh, let me unmute myself. Uh, uh, we're out of time. Uh, thank both of our
uh, colloquium presenters this time. Special treat and a very fascinating uh, uh, set of ideas. Um, and uh, as I said, uh, I hope to see you again in one month for our next colloquium. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks.